Fifi. Give me a Zoom hug. Give me a Zoom hug. I don't feel like it was Fifi. I believe Amici. We're happy to see him. And we're genuinely curious how you're doing because America, the world is getting battered. Your whatever hope or optimism, even the psychological professor spirit that you carry around like it's wearying john we're losing you're losing you realize that your quest for decency and equality you are losing no matter how graceful you try to be in your country in our country led by racist leaders as you write books clamoring for leadership so we ask you genuinely how are you doing are you okay i am um uh, i am exhausted i'm exhausted but I am incredibly privileged, and so my exhaustion is an indulgence at this point. Um, I would point out to you this. Uh, evil always looks like it's winning. The, the nature of evil is, and its downfall ultimately, is its incredible need to be right right now. Its incredible need to be, like, to win tomorrow. This is the, this is the thing with evil. Because it needs to win now, it impress on you its 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 power now. It never has the strategic outlook to actually be victorious in the long term. Think of any dynasty you'd like of. I mean, <clears throat> the British Empire is a really good example, right? We were winning. There wasn't any possibility that we would lose our stranglehold, literally, on two thirds of the world. And then one day, gone. So you know, whether it's cowardly senators or <clears throat> uncommonly indecent tech bros, it doesn't really matter. They're going to lose. And not because good always prevails, because that's not true, but because evil has a habit of just not thinking strategically. It doesn't look like it's losing right now, though, because one of the things that you must find uncommonly wearying is someone who's just clamoring for decency. Just, I mean, it's such a bare minimum ass tolerance, such a such a useless word. Can you just tolerate me? And at every turn, it's like, fuck off. No, no, I can't even tolerate you like. The selfishness, everything, the, the choosing of the dollar as we literally destroy the earth in a way that can't be ignored is terrifying, John. Terrifying. It, it's disappointing. Um, it, the, the, there does come a point where you can no longer be, um, you can't be afraid for long periods of time. You know, there's tons of experiments that have been done with lots of different types of people where they've exposed them to fear for a period of time and then there comes a point where you just you can't be afraid there's not enough chemicals left in your body so you just you have to think what else can i do and you know we are led by uh, little scandinavian girls who, who are telling us that the earth is is burning and they are making a difference we're led by Lots of people who at the grassroots are making a difference. I, I am the, you know, I'm the doomsayer. I come on here and I, I uh, nag and regress and all the, but they can't win. You know, these, these people who insist that the color of a person's skin or their country of origin will forever determine their potential and, and, and how well perceived they are, they can't win. These people who think the presence of a transgender athlete will destroy it all, they can't win. They can make a huge amount of noise right now, like messy toddlers with ice cream all over their face and sticky stuff that you don't know where it's come from all over their hands, but they can't win. They can't. You sound more hopeful than it feels right now as you're confronted at every turn, not just with ignorance and hate and racism, but selfishness. Uh, John, I don't know what you thought the last decade was going to be, but I vastly underestimated, vastly, <laughs> vastly underestimated the race problems in this country and in yours and around the world and vastly, vastly underestimated that democracy and freedom could this quickly come under duress, peril, and be this fra <clears throat> this fragile, where I feel I'm in the—I'm sitting in the middle of I may soon lose freedom. 
that is a particularly American concern. It, it is not that I don't think freedom is important, but but Americans have weaponized the, the phrase freedom more than any other. Democracy, is it under threat? Yes. Has it been under threat since senators and and politicians in general in America and Britain, really what they should have when, you know, in Britain you see them in the, in the lovely um, parliament in the House of Commons and, and Lords, you see them in their suits, but what you should really see them in is like those racing car driver uniforms, you know, the ones that are plastered with badges of sponsors everywhere. That's really what you should see when you look at your senators and politicians, because that's what it is. It's not, it's not a positive. I, I think it's deeply troubling. I resist. I support causes that I think will fight against it. But I just, what people want, what evil wants is for good people to believe that apathy is the correct response. That's what evil really wants. For those of us who would muster our resources to be targeted and strategic in the way we fight back, the way we speak up, they want us to believe that it's futile and that what we should do is shut up. And so I have realized that I have contributed to some people feeling like it is futile to resist and it is not. Resistance is not futile. What happened, John, that births Donald Trump and Boris Johnson? Oh, well, I mean, they're not new phenomena. I mean, Donald Trump and Boris Johnson are particularly clownish, but they're not new phenomena. The idea that someone who, uh, I, I don't know if you know this, but Boris Johnson, when he was in, in, in school at Eton, his headmaster, uh, his report card became public, one of his report cards, and the headmaster essentially said, describe the man he is today, a person who thought that the rules didn't really apply to him, who thought that he should accelerate at an ever-increasing pace through life and achieve everything that he thought he deserved without putting in any effort. And that... That is that kind of unearned privilege, that, that kind of arrogance of station defines people like Donald Trump and Boris Johnson. People who love to tell you the story about how they're self-made, but forget the bit about their father giving them $3 million. Forget the bit about the school that they went to that no one else could have gone to and the privilege that that earned them, the Bullingdon Club that they were a part of. Do you, do you know the Bullingdon Club when Boris Johnson was there? It's a, it's, a, it's a posh kind of posh blokes. Within a very posh environment, it's the poshest of the posh blokes. They used to have something that they do when they walk through the streets. If they ever found themselves a rough sleeper, someone who was homeless, they would walk up to that person with a wad of cash. And as they looked to hand it over to this person, great gratitude in that person's eyes, they would burn it in front of them. This kind of man is not new. This kind of man is a petulant man-child with privilege oozing out of every gross pore. But I refuse to let someone I hold in such contempt, both Trump and Johnson, I refuse to let somebody I hold in such contempt kind of neuter my enthusiasm for the fact that I think the world can be better, and I think there are enough people who believe that too. Speaking to that, you mentioned something in passing there, and I don't think this is being covered a lot in the mainstream media, the weaponizing of a transgender athlete breaking records at Penn, a man, formerly a man, uh, swimming as a woman, and just the assault. A woman swimming, a woman swimming. Uh, yes, understood. But you understand how this stuff gets weaponized. And I you, do. And but it's, it's because it's, it, you know, it's, it's stupid. The percentage of transgender people in the world is so small, so shockingly small that to focus on that group is in and of itself a signal that people are reaching to try and find ways to polarize. Uh, you know, uh, what I love m more than this is the fact that uh, we're talking about women's sport here. And everybody in this room knows that despite the fact that we all know utterly remarkable athletes who are women, utterly remarkable women who I, I certainly, my career is owed to a woman who is a, Susan Robinson, who is a, uh, an All-American at Penn State, 
she was just amazing. The spin move that kind of loosely kept me even viable for the NBA is something that she taught me. And it was a good spin move. It was your 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 spin. Look, man, you could put up thirteen points in a quarter with that spin move. It wasn't very guardable. You put a big hip on somebody, and and then you 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 could do it. Like it's okay. Yeah. A woman taught you yeah. that. Yes, yes, she did. And 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 I've told her many times how grateful I am for this and the time that she spent with me when I just didn't get stuff because I was so late to the game. But the thing is, here we are talking about how a transgender person is going to spoil women's athletics. And the thing that frustrates me is most of these men, and it is men talking about this, most of these men, they didn't give a shit about it, women's basketball or women's sport five seconds ago. They've never once thought about Title IX and how women deserve to have some kind of recognition for the effort. They all work just as hard to end up in a situation where they get remunerated like somebody who works at Hardee's. This is... Where were these people? Where was their indignation for all of these many years when women have been left without for the same effort to put in? And now, now when they think it's a culture war issue, now they want to get exercised, excited and exercised about this one athlete. No, I won't give them that. As if you'd change genders to dominate pin swimming. Utterly ridiculous. And, and you know, the thing is, we only ever see it this way, right? We only ever hear this conversation about transgender women. And, and the reason we only ever hear about transgender women is because men, um, we don't care about women. We just care about men. A and straight men believe that they have this right to know the origin story of every woman, no matter whether they're, to them it's a real woman or whether it's not to them. This rid ridiculous idea of real. Men fixate on transgender women because men think it is the most awful, terrible thing that any man could do to remove this thing that makes us so powerful. That's why they think it's disgusting. It's the same reason, the exact same reason why straight men find gay men distasteful. Outside of the kind of imbecilic yuck factor, it's the fact that in the mind of many straight men, a gay man has decided to be less masculine, less of a man. A lesson I would happily disabuse people of. Can you help me navigate the complicated subject matter of the Olympics and China and business relationships and everyone being compromised? I think of you as somebody not just fundamentally decent who uh, studies the human mind and is interested in really leading us to a better and more decent place. But on bare minimum terms, we can all sort of agree that human rights matter. I thought that was something we could all agree on. And here we are going to China and we're going to have a sports spectacle where the athletes are not, they're being discouraged from speaking freely. We're a tennis player. We still don't know if she's okay. A famous Chinese tennis player who was sexually abused. And as all our business relationships are compromised by the commerce that runs between here and China, please give me something that is smarter than I'm hearing anywhere else on this subject matter. Cause everyone's bought and compromised here. That, no, uh, listen, I, I don't know that I am any less compromised. I, I, I know that we as an organization, APS Intelligence as an organization, works with uh, Chinese companies that would be under the same duress as all others to, to stick to the party line, literally. Um, I, I, I think it's important that we say this first. I, and I didn't, all, I didn't used to know this. Um, it is really important that we disambiguate, that we separate the people of a country from the government of a country. It's, it's hard for us to do sometimes, but sometimes we imagine we say China is bad because of what it's doing to the Uyghurs. And all of China is not bad for what is happening with the Uyghurs. The government of the officials of the power sources of China is certainly, uh, if not responsible, complicit. And so it's important that we don't end up in this situation where broadly Asian people find themselves targeted because of the bad acts of a government, because um, then British people and Americans alike would be in a hard pressed place. The world is too interconnected and we have relied <clears throat> on an economy that makes stuff cheaper so that everybody, no matter their status, can buy stuff. And until that, ref until that framework shifts, until 
people say, I will not mind the fact that I can't uh, grab hold of Amazon, my app and order something and have it arrive tomorrow, then we're all complicit. I am complicit in what happened to the Uyghurs. But because of the connections that I have, the companies that I'm, I use, whether I'm uh, top of head on, on them or not. When it comes to sports, I think there is something different here. There's an additional layer, which is that, I, I mean, Amazon, as much as it claims to be a warm and fuzzy company, I think anybody who forces their people to live in cars while wearing um, nappies at work is, is probably pretty compromised. But sport claims that human rights uh, are, are, are unassailable. Sport claims that sport is a human right. Sport claims that it's a vehicle for change. And yet, the second it meets the mildest resistance, it, it falls over. Sport claims that it cares about human dignity, and yet when it comes to football, for example, uh, British so soccer as opposed to, um, we've got a World Cup that's going to a country where three, well, more than 3,000 people have died. 3,000 mostly immigrants have died in the making and the building of that, of that stadium. So whether you're talking about Uyghur in China, whether you're talking about the suppression of democratic rights in, in China or in Hong Kong, whether you're talking about what's happening in Qatar or America or the United Kingdom, we are all complicit because much like with climate change, we're not willing to do the things that would be required of us to force change. So should anyone be doing anything? I can't put this on the athletes, but oftentimes athletes do rise up in these situations. They do. I'm not necessarily sure that rising up in China is a good idea. I think boycotting is, is one of the things that's always available, but people have to realize the consequences are dire, especially for the Olympic athletes who are generally not paid as much unless they are also in one of the recognized sports leagues. This is not an issue of, you know, are we not tired of being under the illusion that one charismatic figure will change the world? No, I suppose we're not tired of that because it's nicer to believe that if LeBron James said some words about China, that would change because then it, it obviates us of the responsibility to do anything ourselves, to stop buying stuff made in Chinese factories to stop buying the stuff that is made in prisons in America to make it so cheap. Of all the things that you've seen over the pandemic, John, selfishness, billionaire wealth making the income disparities across the world even more appalling than they already were, what are the things fast forward over the pandemic where you're like, God almighty, can we just slow some of this down? some of this so that I can stop being dispirited and exhausted every day? Um, I, I um, <clears throat> this is, so this is what I saw over the pandemic, right? Because I, I, I retired from the NHS in December. I didn't, I didn't get a chance to talk to you, but yeah, I left after 10 years, I, I retired. I'll probably rejoin when things are a little less busy, but I'm retired from the NHS for now. But I spent the last two years in the NHS, uh, National Health Service in Britain. And, and <clears throat> during the height of the pandemic, I, I, as a board member, was sending two condolence letters a week to my colleagues. I have 31,000 colleagues. Uh, and I was sending two condolence letters a week to the families of people who died. And <clears throat> as, as woke as I am, I, I thought of the doctors and I thought of the nurses. And then suddenly I realized that it was the, it was the porters and it was the cleaning staff whose young children were being deprived fathers and mothers. And so through the pandemic, what I realized is that we have to give a damn about each other. And that's it. How many calls have some of your listeners been on with their junior colleagues where they've watched them in their most intimate space, hot laptop on their knee while they're perched on the edge of a bed with their roommates walking behind them? We've seen our people and our colleagues as people. 
And now we have an opportunity to say we actually give a damn about them and live up to that. And not just about paying people more, but giving people a better experience. And that's what I think we can focus on. I don't think that people are paying enough attention, John, to the way or how things have to be systemically for minorities to be disproportionately impacted by everything that's happened over the pandemic for a number of different reasons uh, and not because they deserve it. Like when you see the numbers, you see that some people just can't afford to get vaccinated because they need to keep going to the meatpacking plant because America will not do meat scarcity. And we, you know, we keep basically throwing human beings into the mall and more often than not, they're black or brown. There is always going to be that, well, at this moment, there's there's always going to be that discrepancy across society where black and brown people are disproportionately uh, impacted whenever there is something that will harm society that comes along, whether it's a pandemic or whether it's a financial crash. Women are always going to be more harmed by societal ills. Immigrants always going to be more harmed by societal ills. This is the... This is the system we've set up, and it's, but it's not a very difficult understanding, right? This is because there's a hierarchy of, of dignity in this world. And being a man is higher than being a woman. Being straight is higher than being gay or queer. Being, <clears throat> being white is higher than everything else. And when you start getting combinations of these things that are lower, when you're a, a Latina woman who is queer all of a sudden these people sink so low that the 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 blades of disruption um, they mulch them first but we like this system because those of us who know we're not closest to the blades realize that we have time that is given to us by the very presence of this cannon fodder we're all complicit in this. Every time I walk past a, a rough sleeper, I know I'm part of this. I pay my taxes. But I'm part of the system that allows for a human being to end up sleeping at a bus stop. We all are. It doesn't make us terrible people, but <clears throat> sometimes it's just easier to look away and not realize that maybe now through a pandemic that has killed so many, where so many of the people listening here have been anxious and worried and fearful and mourning, maybe now is the time that we stop pretending that the package that people come in, this that we can see so obviously, should define the amount of dignity that we offer each other. You mentioned the phrase rough sleeper. And I don't know if you've always used that phrase. You mentioned woke a second ago. I want to talk to you about that, too, before we get to the fun stuff and stump the meech. But uh, I have had to change some of the language around this. Homeless, hobo, bum. Some of the things that I used to say when I was a kid uh, is now unhoused. And I have not heard rough sleeper before. But when did that become something that was part of your lexicon? I actually have no idea. Um, I just, I just know that any time we use the passive tense, you know, we, we talk about people being homeless <laughs> in the same way we talk about um, violence against women, for example. We, we remove the agency of what's actually happening. No, no, no. What's actually happening is men are abusing women. Men are raping women. That is what's happening. So let's not take away the the, the causal agent. And I just know that. You know, people, when you talk about homelessness, it's as if they've just forgotten. <laughs> I've, I've lost my house. I don't know where it is. I have one. I could go to it, but it's my fault. I'm too drunk. Or I don't speak the right language or something else. But it's not that. You know, I, my um, my sister worked at a, a shelter. Now, this is this is decades ago. Decades ago when, when I realized she was a better person than me. And she took me there one Saturday morning very early. And I met this man, very thick German accent. And he was talking to my sister and I was looking at him and I had a very, I was, you know, maybe a bit saviorish in my approach. I had a very good idea about why people end up like this. It's because they don't really work hard. They've not tried to fit in, right? 
and he talked to my sister and then my sister made me go and talk to him. Uh, I didn't want to. And suddenly I realized this life in front of me. This man was a physicist. His wife had died and he had felt such despair that for a period of time he couldn't function. And before you knew it, some house payments had slipped. The house had gone, the car, car, car payments had slipped, the, the car had gone. And, and there he is with a, with a suitcase and a mind a little fractured, seeking solace in the bottom of a bottle by a bus stop. And you suddenly realize this isn't about individual people who are pointless in society or, or worthless. It's about a system that so arbitrarily assigns value to human beings. How do you feel about being dismissed as woke these days? Because you have lived a lot of this, John. Big, gay, black man in sports, uh, British accent, trying to fit in as confident and smart as a person as I've ever met, and yet the world too cruel to be trusted with the vulnerability of I'm going to tell you that I'm gay. You deserve, some for some reason, to know my sexuality. Uh, when I dismiss you with too woke as just fighting for this before it was trendy, wanting this for others because you wanted it for yourself because your mother taught you that she did not live a fun life, but she led a full life because she was able to help others and just be fundamentally decent. For you, when you get dismissed as woke now, as this is all weaponized and an army of people are fighting you every day more than you've ever seen before, right? You've been hated for a long time. You have big, mm -hmm. big, big gay black man who thinks he knows more than everyone else because he usually does, and has the, and, that you're going to find me a date, and, um, ha and has <clears> the <throat> ego to show it too, and has the ego uh, believes he's smarter than everyone in every room that he walks into, and is everyone. constantly, constantly disproven by a physicist who makes him learn and humbles him. Exactly, that's the thing. I mean, being smart is about being open to learning new things. That, that's all it takes to be smart. To realize that you don't know everything is is all it takes. Um, woke, yes, woke is a device used by ignorant people in order to shut others up. It's a it's a mechanism uh, to make you feel guilty about caring. Woke in your dictionary is that Miriam Webster um, is well informed and up to date. The second definition underneath it is alert to injustice in society, especially racism. And, and all I know is that when somebody uses that as if it was a pejorative, I know that they are trying to silence me. If anybody uses it against me, like political correctness, they can use those words around me. I simply know who they are. They have identified themselves to me and they have ensured that I'm going to be more vociferous and louder, more accurate, cleverer because I know what they want is my apathy and I shall not give it to them. They want my silence and they shall not have it. Even though you gave it to him right there with an <laughs> awkward silence that allows me to sell his book right now as, yes! we, as we transition into Stump the Mage, it is The Promises of Giants. This man, if you like what it is that he does or has to say, I tell you, he is as eloquent as anyone I've ever met. He's, uh, he'd love to write. I don't, I don't even understand this part of you because you're a very busy man, but there was something about writing that spoke to you, and it's very difficult, but you do a very good job of conveying complicated thoughts, and this book is necessary right now. I don't mean to sell it or shill it so overtly, but you wrote this book essentially because you see an absence of leadership everywhere, and you're just asking everybody, please lead a little bit please yes. people just you lead a little bit you can do something i promise you just a touch just a touch blah 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 you guys done fixing the world already you're yep ready, you ready, ready to get to your some ass kicked me legit good work here yes yeah, uh, what's what's interesting that matters the, so the joy that you take in this I, it used to be i i i, I feel like I, I might be turning a corner here therapy might be working I, I, the joy that you take in my absolute destruction in and of itself makes me happy because I know at the end of this, even if I fail, you will be overjoyed. And I've done that for you. You're welcome. You want to know what happened, John? For You're all welcome. Your, for, for all Michael, your, Michael, thank you. Michael, for all your brilliance, for all your brilliance, you showed your true colors 
the one time you got lucky in this game. And if you give someone success, they'll show you their true colors, and I did not. It's been three times. (laughs) Hooey. You won. Uh, this is how I remember it. He's now made it. It used to be two he was arguing for, and now he's made it I three. I won three times. What I recall is, this is all I recall, and honest to God, I'm not trying to doctor the record book. I recall that during the pandemic, ESPN wouldn't send us a goddamn microphone. We were broken as a show, and Mike needed to find some sounds because we had no content. I think we were talking about Tiger King for for about four straight days. Yeah, remember that? I believe we shouldn't have done that. That's a terrible yeah, mistake. Doc Antel, Doc Antel for, uh, is not only someone who is a terrible person, I know this now, who uh, did terrible things to women, but also might be a murderer. That's We did not know that at the time. We were starved for content. According to others, don't put that on him. We don't know. According to a documentary about his life in three parts on Netflix, but you beat us because we were hey, broken. we report, you decide. We were broken during the pandemic. Broken. <laughs> and and you beat us because we couldn't find enough sounds because our library wasn't even working. Right. Big asterisk. Dan, Dan, Michael, you're welcome. Huh. I don't know what you're trying to do, but it's working. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right, let's do this. Five. But, but I'm still going to kick your ass. And it's a supersized version of something meets. We're going with seven clips here. Oh, good God. All right. How about how confident are you? Jesus, seven clips. Are you confident enough, Mike, that if you think this is going to be an ass kicking, are you willing to declare him a winner if he gets three because of the degree? Three is too much. But I was, because I'm so confident, I was going to say if you merely get two of these seven right, I would deem you a push. If you get three, you win the game. So you are willing to do that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, he was so kind with that thank you thing. It was weird. All right. Are you ready? Yeah. Yes. He he really manipulated you. You're well, welcome. I've been hypnotized into doing something. I know. You, are you ready now? I've to change the math. Usually the first one is easy. It's the easiest one. Usually if one. you get more wrong, what what is happening? What is the first sound for John Amici on a Stugatz mispronunciation? Opportunity. Opportunity. So I want to say opportunity. Opportunity. Do you opportunity. Want, do you want to say it or are you saying it? There's a tootie in there. Yeah. Opportunity. Uh, do you want to say it or are you saying it? No, I'll, I'll it, go with opportunity. Okay, because it sounds like he tripped over the second P. Opportunity. And, and the second P made him hit his chin on a speed bump of, opportunity. Uh, made of cement. Uh, but I also think it's opportunity. Opportunity. Is that your final answer? Yes, that was his yes. final answer. Oh, my God. A strong start by Amici. Oh, wow. There are six more, and Chris Cody's laughing back there. Start. Okay, so. That's all you need to get. <laughs> okay, taunted from another side of the room. Did you did you collect this batch? I enjoy this game. Uh, let's get the second it's one. It's almost as if every game has a running theme. <laughs> almost. Here's your second option. <laughs> <laughs> it is a it's a riot. It's a ribbit. It's a frog. It's it, it, it still got to as it, a frog. It, 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 this is my haunted it, it, nightmares it, it, outside my window when I'm sleeping at night. It, 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 a frog it, it, with it, it, Stugatz's face on it. It's like is Jaws. It? It's getting closer. Um, I I don't know. Is it? Is it? Is it? Yes. Is. 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 I feel quite good about that. I feel quite good about that. I was was in the ballpark. Yeah. Not far away. (laughs) The third one for it. I (laughs) order it. I order it. It sounds like something he'd shout at you by going uh, past you on a merry-go-round that's out of control. I order it. It's got the Doppler effect built in. I order it. I order it. I order it. It sounds like Ireland, but I can't imagine any context where he'd need to say that. This is two words. Uh. Oh. A I order it. A clue. I order it. 
I heard her. My initial guess was Iowa. I heard her. I, I don't know this one. I don't know. Oh, wow. Just a quit. So he quits. It is him saying, I order. I order. Not, not oh, too no. hard. No, I would never, there's not a chance I would have got that. Okay, but no, I, now I hear it, though, at least. At least I usually I can't even hear him anywhere in these. Because... I order. Yeah, that, I can you see can how he would now. make ordered seven syllables. I order. All right, here's your next one. Dut. <laughs> Dut. 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 One word or two. It's a dance club. It's the word Mesopotamia. It's uh it's one word. Dut Don't A good guess. Oh wow, that was a good guess. Didn't. Didn't. Oh, you were right there. You were so close. So close. This is your so this game of inches. Uh, Allie. <laughs> Allie. <laughs> it's uh, his last words Allie. Uh, while being stabbed to death. <laughs> Allie. 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 Yes. Uh, Allie. <laughs> Allie. 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 <laughs> Allie. Is it one word or two? One word. Allie. 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 I think I might hear this. Allie. 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 Sounds like Maui to me or Cali. I can't tell. I was going to go Allie. Without. <laughs> okay. Allie. That is... It's quality work, That's right? not possible. That's offensive. That That's not offensive. Uh, How many do we have left? You have two more. Oh, it's possible to win, then. Good. Yeah, it is possible. You've gotten one, and two's a push. You can push. Yeah, you can push. You can still win this, and you have that winner's mentality. You're welcome. I do. I do. <laughs> is that one word or two? One word. <laughs> It's an iguana sneezing. <laughs> Touch. Final answer? Yeah. Top. I've noticed you're a lot quicker with the I got it wrong sound than you were with the I got it right sound. Well, I never assume that you're going to get one right, so I have to look for it for a little uh, bit. It's an adjustment. Okay. Top. So this is for a push. This that is, was top, by the way. This is top. just <laughs> for you not to leave a loser. You're going to be a loser here. The best you can do is not lose here. I get can't leave a loser because I know the joy in Michael's heart when I go away. It's fine. For shot. For shot. Is this for two shot. words? This is one word. Uh, for shot. You thought it was for sure as well. For shot. 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 Hold on a second. That's a bit relentless. Hold on. So it's hard to know which one of the two sounds I'm supposed to focus on here. For shot. For shot. Tell you what, I'm probably playing it too much. It sounds like Dan Aykroyd saying for sure. With for a it does. broadly Bostonian accent. For sure. <laughs> it does. It is. For Dan Aykroyd That's actually in correct. training yeah, that's, 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 voices. Dan Aykroyd saying. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, you got it exactly right. Yeah, that exactly was, uh, we right. threw in a trick. <laughs> You're so good at this game. We threw in a trick and you got it exactly right. It was for Dan, Dan Aykroyd saying for sure in trading places. For sure. All right. Give, give me a guess. Um... One more time. For shot. You said it's one word, so I don't know. First. It sounds like first off. It's Versace. Wow. For shot. You know what the problem is? And this is this is my fault. Um, 
There is no universe where I could have conceived of Stu got saying Versace. <laughs> I I love the idea. I can give you a Moneyball one right now. <laughs> a Moneyball? Uh, yes. To win the yes. whole thing? Yeah. To win the yes. whole thing. Yeah. The juxtaposition. <laughs> the juxtaposition. Is the, the that's just one word, right? <laughs> yes, one word. The juxtaposition. Well, juxtaposition, that's got to be juxtaposition. <laughs> yes, he hits yeah. the money ball. Yes, we didn't want you to leave a loser. We wanted to give you some decency, even though next time you're going to claim you won four times because you have not well, won four no, times. That was the money ball. You win if you hit the money ball. Yes, there you go. All right, how about this? Try to tell me what Chris Mad Dog Russo is trying to say. Uh, but is a Farah is a Farah Farah? How you pronounce it? Farah Farah is a Farah now. <laughs> <laughs> what is Chris this is Mad so Dog good. Russo this is trying so good to say right here? here. This is a uh, but is a Farah is a Farah Farah? How you pronounce it? Farah Farah is a Farah now. <laughs> what this is the reverse? Is Chris Mad Dog Russo. <laughs> Trying to say um, here. Uh, but is a Farah, is a Parah, Farah, how you pronounce it? Parah, Farah is a Farah now. <laughs> That's unbelievable. You know what? I, I'm frustrated with this because I've actually seen this clip. And I can't remember what it was he was supposed to be saying, but I know it's nothing like what he actually said. Uh, but is a Farah, is a Parah, Farah, how you pronounce it? Para Farah is a Farah now, as far as the water sports is concerned, outside of that little area in the Bay Area where the Giants continue to honor him to this Haraya? day. Ha Faraya. And so the Giants oh, continue oh, to yeah. honor him. To... Oh, my God. I had heard that clip before. <laughs> you had the test results. Well, then you definitely lose the money ball. We have to take it back. No, 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 no. You lose. You lose. I'll tell you what, though. I'll tell you what. I'll lose the money ball as long as you feel great about it. I feel fantastic. Yes, I got what I I'll want. I'll take Remember, it. I'll take hey, the L. Hey, I'll hey, take the L. You want to? You want to think back to that first one? Remember, that you got, got the first you one. Got, you, got, you got so excited. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh, this is an easy game opportunity. What do you got next? This never accelerates. I uh, I I won the money ball. I gave it away to enhance your happiness. This has been a good day. It's been a good day. See you later, Amici. Thank you for allowing us to waste your important time. Take care.